So we've covered woven fabrics. We talked about basic woven patterns and novelty woven fabrics. Now we're gonna go into knit fabrics. Uh, knit fabrics are divided into two main categories. So first we are gonna cover weft knitting and then we'll talk a little bit about warp knitting. Now weft knitting is something that you can do at home. So if you've ever done knitting at home, that's the weft knitting kind of knitting. Uh, you can do those on certain machines, but you can also do it at home. But warp knitting, you can only do it on specialty machines because warp knitting requires a warp beam uh, that has to be prepared with the yarns and then it is done in a totally different direction. And we use warp knitting usually to create lace patterns, some curtains and things like that. So those are a little bit special. Uh, Rev knitting is most of the knitting patterns that we use for sweaters, sweatshirts, t-shirts are in the weft knitting category. So we're gonna start talking about knitting first. Uh, and as I mentioned this before, knitting is done by interlocking and interlooping of the yarns. Uh, so it's different from weaving, which is done by interlacing. So in knitting, we are making loops instead of interlaces. So weft knitting, if you look at a weft knit fabric, you'll see that it kind of goes in this direction. So you start knitting one uh, row and then you go to the next row, next row, next row. So it goes in that direction. Uh, but warp knitting is a vertical type of knitting. So it's actually done vertically. So if you follow one loop, it kind of goes almost like a zigzag pattern here. So it goes in a uh, vertical direction. Okay, let's talk about the main differences between weft knitting and warp knitting. We just said weft knitting can be done on a machine, but also can be done by hand, but warp knitting is only done on machines. Uh, in weft knitting, the direction is a little bit different. So you make loops uh, that are joining to one another in the same course. So it means in the same row, but in warp knitting, it kind of moves vertically. Uh, instead of horizontally. Weft knit fabrics are more open fabrics. Warp knit fabrics are much more compact. In weft knitting, you have more design possibilities because uh, you are more independent about your yarns that you're using. Uh, if you are familiar with hand knitting, you can see that you, know, you can change the color of the yarns and you can add different designs. But warp knitting requires this uh, pre-prepared warp beam and so you kind of have some limitations there but it is a very high productivity type of um, knitting process because you knit fabrics much faster with warp knitting compared to weft knitting weft knit fabrics usually run or they can unravel uh, but warp knit fabrics are very very difficult to unravel Weft knit fabrics have a two-way stretch, so it stretches in each direction, but warp knit fabrics have a crosswise stretch because of the way that it is knitted. Uh, weft knit fabrics have finished edges. Warp knit fabrics seldom have finished edges. Uh, weft knit fabrics are produced as shaped garments. You know, you can make fully finished garments in one shot on a knitting machine. So you can knit a sweater completely uh, out of the machine, but warp knit fabrics are only making yardage, you know, they're just making fabric. Uh, we use weft knit fabrics mostly for apparel. Warp knits are used for apparel and interiors. And t-shirts, sweaters, activewear, hosiery, those are good examples of weft knits. But when you look at warp knit materials, those cover the areas like lingerie, uh, sheer lacy curtains, um, some, some types of sweaters sometimes. So these are some examples. The, the, the ones on the top are weft knits and you can see the loops very clearly. Uh, this is a weft knit, this is a weft knit, uh, but the ones at the bottom are warp knit fabrics and you can kind of see the vertical direction of the loops. This is a lace fabric. This one, it's almost hard to, to see the, um, knitting pattern. And here, this also is a warp net. Uh, we have different kinds of machines that are flatbed machines, which are flat, and they just make um, one 
dimensional fabric. Uh, there are circular knitting machines that make circular fabrics. Warp knitting machines are a little bit different. I'll show you some pictures in a second. And you can make them in different widths. Um, so this is a Rochelle knit. This is a warp knit example. And these are made for window curtains. Um, and you see that on this, they actually create the opening for the curtain rod while they're knitting the fabric. So you don't have to do any stitching afterwards. We talked about full fashion products. So full fashion means you finish the complete product on a knitting machine. And this is used for, for example, pantyhose, knee highs, those type of products can be done in one machine in one shot uh, as finished products. In woven fabrics, remember, we have to create the fabric and then we have to sew them into garments. But with knitting, you have a lot more flexibility. Uh, we can also make, of course, yardage. Uh, so we call those knitted yard goods or knitted end products. Um, we'll talk about full fashion sweaters. So this is a sweater that's full, fully fashioned out of the machine. So you can see this is the armhole seam and it's done by the knitting pattern. So they change the knitting pattern to create the armhole. And then this is a sleeve. So you can do that on the machine without having to like make the pieces first and then stitch them together to create the final product. You can make the entire thing on the knitting machine. This is a magnified view. So you can see that they're changing the width of the material by changing some of the loops here. And you can make a lot of changes like knee highs, for example. You know, these come out of a circular knitting machine. It's a left knit machine. And it comes out like this as a finished product. And you, all you have to do is dye it. Okay, so you can see this is a knitting machine. This is a circular one. So you have all these needles making that circular fabric. And then the finished fabric is being wound here. So this is a circular one. This is a warp knitting machine. Um, so let me just open the sound. With warp knitting machines, each individual loop is created from separate lengthwise yarns. Wound onto a beam from yarn packages in a creel, the yarns arranged as a warp must be placed parallel to each other. Normally, for the most basic of fabrics, each yarn needs its own needle. If 1,000 needles are used on this machine, there needs to be a minimum of 1,000 warp yarns. If there is more than one yarn provided for each needle, more elaborate fabrics can be produced. With warp knitting, individual needles knit simultaneously across the width of the machine. Loops are formed by needles knitting a series of warp yarns fed vertically and parallel to the direction of the fabric formation. Warp knitting machines are typically used to produce tricot, Rochelle, and crochet. On a knitting machine, we have these kind of needles. These are called latch needles. They have this latch, and usually that hook holds the yarn while uh, it goes up and down. And there are some different types of needles that are used in warp knitting, so they are a little bit more complex. And I'll explain to you how that works. Uh, again, these are, and this is a circular knitting machine. So in every uh, spot here, there's one of those latch needles. So these needles are standing upward in uh, around this circle and each one gets one yarn. And the, when the looping is being done, you know, each needle raises up and goes down, making a loop. And they kind of go in that order, uh, going all the way around the knitting machine constantly. And then you make your knit fabric at the end. And if it is a certain type of circular knitting machine that is producing these kind of fabrics, I mean, like pantyhose, for example, you can create the entire pantyhose coming out of the machine and then you take that and you dye that. This is kind of a cool production line. So if you think about melt spinning, you create the yarns and yarns are wound on bobbins. You put the bobbins on the circular machine. 
you knit this product and you already have it finished. So it reduces time and required to make a finished product. Now, if you compare knitting to weaving, knit fabrics are more comfortable, they are more elastic, they are more open, so they are more air permeable. Uh, they can be bulky like sweaters, blankets, those type of fabrics are made by knitting. They have good wrinkle recovery. Weaving, uh, we woven fabrics are more stable. They don't stretch as much. They are more compact. They are not as, uh, as air permeable. Uh, knit fabrics are more porous, less opaque. Woven fabrics uh, may have maximum hiding power and cover. Knit fabrics are less stable. They have more shrinkage. Woven fabrics are more stable. They shrink less. In knit fabrics, you can make plain knits. You can make fancy knits. Same thing for woven. You can create a variety of textures and designs. Uh, in knit fabrics, patterns can be changed quickly. Uh, the process is less expensive because you don't have to do the creeling and warping and preparing for the weaving and all that. So you kind of reduce all those steps that makes you uh, that, that makes it easier for you to make changes um, to, to your patterns. But with woven fabrics, it requires a lot of preparation. So you can't easily just change everything and create a new pattern on the weaving machine. You know, it has, you have to go through the preparation steps. So it's less adaptable to fast fashion in that sense, because you can't just make changes quickly. Uh, knit fabrics can be raveled from top or bottom, um, may snag or run. Woven fabrics can be unraveled from any cut edge. So woven fabrics are easier to unravel, but knit fabrics are a little bit harder. You just have to find the top and start pulling the loops out from one direction. All right, so we said needles make the stitches or the loops and we have rails and courses in knit fabrics. So these are more like warp and weft yarns in woven fabrics. Uh, but rails are the vertical columns of stitches or loops, and courses are your horizontal rows of loops. Your fabric density is based on the number of stitches or the number of loops, not yarns. So we still have a fabric count here, and we count that based on the number of rails and courses in one inch. So remember, in woven fabrics, we did fabric count based on the number of warp yarns and the number of filling yarns in one inch. In knit fabrics, we are doing that with rails and courses. Okay, so I'll show you some examples of that. So rails are the vertical columns of stitches and each needle forms one rail and we usually define them as rails per inch. Courses are the horizontal rows and we call them courses per inch, CPI. Okay, so when we are uh, describing the fabric density or fabric count, we usually say, for example, if it has 18 rails and 16 courses, we say 18 by 16 is the fabric count, okay? So you can see it here. These uh, are your loops on a knit fabric. And if you look at those columns, each of these are going to be your rails and your courses are going to be each of these rows of loops, okay? This is a jersey fabric. This is the technical face of a weft knit jersey pattern. And we'll talk about different knit patterns, but jersey is probably one of the most common ones. And jersey patterns are used on our t-shirts, usually our sweatshirts as well. Um, now, this is the back of a jersey. And the only difference is if you notice here, the crown of the loops, we call these the crown. The crown of the loops are in the back on the face. You see that the crowns are in the back. So when you look at a jersey fabric, you usually see these lines here. Those are more visible to your eyes. And those um, are going to look like little Vs going down through the grain line. So your rails are in the direction of your grain. And when you look at a knit fabric, 
with your eyes, you're going to see just those V's going in each column. But if you look at the back, and again, pay attention to the crown. If you look at the back of the jersey fabric, the crown is actually forefront. So when you look at the back of a jersey, what you're going to see is those half circles. Half circles going this way, half circles going this way. Okay. So again, these are your rails and these are your courses. So if I ask you to count how many rails are in this picture, that would be one here, two, three, four, five rails. And then if I say how many courses, then you're going to count each of these rows. So I would say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight courses here, okay? So on a fabric, if you are calculating the fabric count, again, you have to do it in one inch. So if this is a fabric that we are trying to analyze, uh, we're gonna draw a line for one inch. I think this is only half an inch of the fabric though. So you can just count half an inch and multiply it by two uh, in this direction. And you're gonna do the same thing in this direction, okay? So this one, it says 18 rails and 21 courses in one inch, okay? Uh, this is a rib knit fabric. We're going to talk a little bit more in detail about the pattern. So right now, just ignore the pattern. Um, as you can see, you know, the loops are not as regular as these because it's a different pattern. But in this case, you're still counting your columns and your rows to calculate your fabric count. The gauge of a fabric is the fineness of the stitch. So for example, here, your gauge is determined by how many needles are uh, on this one inch of this fabric. And each needle makes one loop. So basically your gauge has a lot to do with the number of rails you have in one inch. And um, we call it a gauge or a cut on the machine. So it shows the fineness of the stitch. This is how close your needles are to each other. So the higher the gauge is, the finer the fabric is going to be. In fine fabrics, you may have 28 needles per inch. In coarse fabrics, you may use 18 needles per inch. If this is a jersey fabric, this is a technical phase. When you turn the back of the fabric where you can see the half circles, that would be considered the technical back of the fabric. But in knitting, sometimes for design purposes, you can use the back of the fabric as the design phase. Uh, or the face of the fabric as the back. Uh, skew is something we did talk about, you know, if your grain is not straight, that's called a skew. So we have that with knit fabrics. Uh, circular knits usually have an off grain course, which is not very straight. Um, we already talked about fully fashioned knits. So these are fabrics, uh, these are fully finished garments that you produce on a, a knitting machine. And you do this by adding stitches or reducing stitches uh, to create your shape. This is a full, fully fashioned sweater. And by uh, making these extensions, you know, this might again be an armhole or some other part of the garment where you would normally stitch together by using two different separate pieces. But in this case, this comes out like that on the, from the knitting machine. Uh, this is a mock full fashion, which means they didn't knit this on the machine. They actually stitched those pieces together after making the fabric in yardage. Um, now, these are the steps that we use to knit fabrics. The first step is the running step. And if you look at these needles, you know, this is what you're going to have. This is a flatbed machine and there are needles going across here. So you can see those latch needles. And the first process is running where the needle moves up and the old stitch slides down the needle. Um, the clearing is when the needle is in its highest position. So I'm going to show you these steps in a video. In this segment, we describe how needles actually do their work. How are the needles arranged and what causes them to move? 
Knitting machines are designed so that each needle can be placed in a groove cut into the outside of a metal cylinder. Before we show you how these cylinders work, let's define the parts. The cuts or grooves may also be referred to as slots or tricks. The top edge of each groove is called the verge. These cylinders are very precisely manufactured, so the diameter measured at any place is equal. Machines are classified by the number of cuts per linear inch. This is referred to as the cut or gauge of the machine. For example, an eight gauge machine has eight cuts per inch. The total number of cuts around the circumference of the cylinder would indicate the number of needles in the cylinder. The more needles, the wider the fabric. Now let's take a closer look at the needle itself and label its parts. At the top of each needle is a hook. Below this is a latch attached with a rivet. Notice that the bottom edge or cup of the latch is curved to fit over and completely close the hook. At the bottom of the needle is a butt which plays a part in controlling how needles activate, up or down. A needle with a latch is very efficient. When the latch needles are used to create weft knits, the knitting cycle can be completed without any auxiliary attachments. Here's how the latch needle works. At rest or running position, a knit loop rests above or on the latch. As the needle moves up, the old loop already formed drops below and clears the latch. As the needle moves down, it receives the new yarn to begin forming a new stitch. The latch is knocked over by the old loop, and this old loop is cast off. The needle moves further down to fully form and complete the new stitch. The amount of yarn used to form a new stitch determines the stitch length. This is important because stitch length affects the weight, width, and aesthetics of the fabric. On modern day knitting machines, needles make millions of loops or stitches a day. Needles may need to be replaced due to wear, but they usually last up to six months, depending on construction, yarn type, fiber type, and speed. Okay, so the video showed you how these running, clearing, feeding, knockover, and pulling steps work when you're making loops on a knitting machine. And you can see the needles here. So each needle is going through each of those steps one by one. Um, you saw some circular knitting machines where the needles are placed on a circular space and on a flat bed, the needles are all side by side. And in, with a circular machine, you can create fabrics like this. For example, this, is, uh, this looks like a cuff and again, this is the technical face of a jersey fabric. So you usually see these Vs on the surface. Those crowns are hidden in the back, so you don't necessarily see those circles so much. And on the back of the fabric, when you look at this fabric from the back, you see the top of the crowns. So you can see those half circles. There are a couple of designs that you can do with knit fabrics, uh, tuck stitch is one of them. So in a tuck stitch, your old stitch stays on the needle while you're catching new yarn to make another loop. So you actually end up with two loops because you kind of miss one of them here. So this creates a different kind of look on the fabric. And you can see that this one loop is stretched out a little bit more. So you have a little more gap here and um, if I can show you some fabrics with tuck stitches, I'll show you that. Um, there's also a float or a mist stitch. Uh, so a float is where in a float or mist stitch, the hook of the needle doesn't catch the yarn. And so your yarn doesn't make a loop. So it just stays like a float. So I'm going to show you a little animation on how to make the tuck stitch and also the float or the mist stitch, okay? In this segment, we discuss the design of the fabric and the basic stitches that make up knits.
there are only three types of loops or stitches possible in weft knitting, knit, tuck, and float. Let's take a look at the first one, the knit stitch. If every needle is fed a yarn and goes through the basic knitting cycle, the product is referred to as single jersey. All loops are knitted and all loops look exactly alike. Look closely at this drawing of a regular knit loop. The length of yarn in that loop is called the stitch length. Notice how each loop has what can be identified as legs and a crown. The fabric at the left is technically the face side and the stitches have an overall vertical appearance. On this side, you see primarily legs rather than crown. The fabric at the right is technically the back, which takes on a horizontal appearance. In this view, you see mainly crowns. Referred to as a jersey stitch, stitches arranged in this pattern have a distinctly different look and feel from the face to the back. Another type of stitch is referred to as the tuck stitch because one yarn is tucked behind another and hides. The pattern on the left shows the technical face for a tuck stitch. Follow the green shaded course of yarn across the pattern and it looks like a loop has been tucked behind another. The pattern on the right shows the technical back for a tuck stitch. From the back, the tuck is more visible to the eye. How is a tuck stitch made? During the tuck cycle, at feed one, the needle moves up from its rest position and the old stitch that has been formed is held and not allowed to clear the latch. Yet the needle moves up far enough to grab a second yarn, which is put into a tuck position. Both yarns are then kept at the rest position. The knit cycle occurs with the next feed of yarn. At this time, both yarns are cleared. A new yarn is fed and pulled through both the held and tuck loops, forming a tuck stitch. The stress caused by holding one elongated stitch for an extra course causes more length shrinkage, but less in width than a regular knitted stitch. The tuck loop makes the fabric wider and thicker and slightly less extensible. What is the overall structural effect of tucks on knits? Tuck stitches can give the fabric a cellular appearance. Some people refer to this as mesh. Tucks are the basis for pique, typically used for golf and tennis shirts, which need to breathe, retain their shape, but have some stretch. A wide range of pique constructions can be made depending on the use and frequency of tuck stitches. The third type of stitch is the float, which is also called a mist stitch. The drawing on the left is a technical face. On the face, in the middle course of yarn and middle whale, it looks like the machine has hidden the colored yarn in the back. It is not captured or knit with any other stitch. This is the float or mist stitch. On the technical back, you can see how the loop floats. To produce the float stitch, on feed one, a yarn is laid to rest behind the hook of the needle. The needle remains at the rest position. It is not activated in the float cycle. In the knit cycle, it is. When a subsequent yarn is knit at the next feed, the missed yarn floats to the technical back of the fabric. Loops can be made to float over a series of whales. To make the structure secure, some float yarns can be tied into the ground with a jersey or tuck stitch. Float loops make the fabric more narrow and less extensible because the floated yarn is in a straight configuration. Why would you produce a structure with loops that float? Floats are useful for pattern effects where some colors appear on the front and others are hidden on the back. This checkerboard pattern uses gray and white yarns. When the gray yarn knits, forming a gray square on the front, the white yarn floats to the back. If you turn the fabric over and inspect the back, the colors appear reversed. A second use is to create surface effects or change the performance of the fabric. You can make loops float on one side of the fabric then nap them to produce a fleece. If not napped, these floats can be used for aesthetics or function. 
You've just seen how three stitch formations can be used in different ways. All can be produced on warp or weft machines or used for single or double knits. So you guys saw how tuck stitches and float stitches or miss stitches are done. Uh, now I want to talk a little bit about patterns. So web knit fabrics have three main patterns, jersey, rib, and pearl patterns. Okay, and there are other variations that are a little bit more fancy designs, like piles and jacquards, just like the woven fabrics. And then there are also double weft knits. Uh, these are like double cloth fabrics, like interlock double knit, jacquard double knit. Um, those are different types of patterns, but the basic three patterns are jersey, rib, and pearl. Jersey is also called single jersey. And again, on the face of the fabric, you see those V's. These are the loops, but you see the legs of the loops and not the crowns. The crowns are in the back. And when you look at the uh, back of a jersey fabric, you usually sh see the half circles. So this is the face of a single jersey with the V's on the front. And this is the back of it where you have those half circles. That's a jersey pattern. This is a jersey pattern. Again, you see the V shapes on the front and the half circles on the back. This is a knit fabric made with metallic yarns. So this is actually the face of the fabric. This is the technical face, but on the back of the fabric, they put these um, sequins and they use the back of this fabric as the fashion face of the fabric. Here again, this is a sweater, but in some parts of the sweater, they use the technical face of the jersey and then they flip the fabric they flip the fabric and use the back of the jersey on one side of the sweater to create a certain fashion design. So if you look closely, this is your jersey front and this is the back of the jersey and they use them together on the outside of a sweater. Rib knit is a design that we usually use on cuffs and collars. Uh, especially on your sweatshirts, on your t-shirts. If you look at your cuffs uh, or if you look at your necks, necklines, you can see that the knit pattern on those areas is a little more stretchy and it can open up more. So we use those where we require a little more stretch. This is a rib pattern. So this is uh, actually a two by two rib pattern. So you can see two rows of jersey and then two rows of the back of a jersey. So when you stitch it like this, those uh, two rows and those two rows kind of come too close to each other and it allows you to stretch the fabric a lot more. Okay, because of this design. This is a four by two rib knit sweater. Uh, when I say four by two, that means you have four whales and then two whales are stitched like the back of a jersey. So you have the four whales stitched like a regular jersey and then two as the back of a jersey. The back of this area here is right here. Okay. And then again, the back of this is right here. This is a one by one a rib, one by one rib looks a whole lot like a jersey knit because you can't really see the one row that is um, stitched like the back of a jersey in between. So you just see that. This is a two by two rib. You see the two rows of jersey and two rows of the back of a jersey. If you look at this switch sweater, I think this is a knit sweater. So you see the single jersey design here on the main body of the sweater, but this is a one by one rib. So on the rib, you get a lot more stretch on that collar. Okay. So this is a jersey knit face of the fabric. This is the back. And this is a one by one rib face of the fabric. And this is the back. 
So the rib fabric that is one by one or two by two, those would be reversible fabrics because the face and the back would look just the same. Okay, pearl fabrics are reversible. And basically pearl knit is the back of a jersey. So it's the semicircular shapes, the half circles is what you're gonna see on the face of the fabric. But the difference between jersey and pearl is both on the face and on the back of the fabric, you're gonna see those half circles, okay? So pearl looks like this. This is the face, this is the back, and they look exactly the same. So this looks like the back of a jersey, but the way it is knit, it actually creates these half circles on each side of the fabric. This scarf is made with a pearl pattern. So you can see face and back of the scarf, it's the same. Another pearl, you see the half circles and you see it close up. So these two fabrics here are the jersey fabrics. This is the face, this is the back. But this one is the pearl face of a pearl and the back of this fabric is, looks exactly the same. But this is a rib fabric, two by two rib. So this fabric is reversible because the back of this looks exactly the same. So jersey fabrics are not reversible, but pearl and rib fabrics can be reversible. Okay, so on this one, piece of fabric, you can see all of the patterns. So this is Jersey on top. This is pearl. This is a one by one rib. And this is a two by two rib. And you see how the one by one rib kind of gets a little bit narrower. Uh, and this is a cool thing about rib patterns because when you're making cuffs with that, it kind of grabs your wrist, but it also allows you to stretch it a lot when you're taking it on and off. Um, but it has the same number of loops, the same number of whales as this area, and the same number of needles are used to make this versus this. You know, it looks wider, but it is just because it kind of contracts um, when, when it's a rib design. Now we'll talk a little bit about other variations of knits like jacquard jersey. This design is produced with yarns of different colors and you can create uh, completely different intricate patterns with jacquard jersey. And you guys probably have heard of cable knits. So those are gonna give you the cable pattern. This is a jacquard jersey where you are creating a little monkey picture with colored yarns that you're using. Uh, this is actually a jersey pattern here, but on the back, you have a lot of mist stitches and floats. So for example, you know, you're using these white or cream colored yarns here, but when you're making the face of the monkey, you need those browns and grays. So the white yarns are floating in the back and not making any stitches in the front. This is a design created by tuck stitches. So you see that those stitches are, uh, the loops are made by tuck stitches here. So it creates this kind of design. This is the face, this is the back. This is a cable pattern. This is the face and this is the back. So the cable pattern is created using the one by one rib knit. And it just, um, Again, it's a reversible pattern. Another cable pattern here, face and the back. This is a herringbone design. Uh, we talked about herringbone design on woven fabrics, so this is kind of similar. This is the herringbone design with knit fabrics where you have that um, kind of herringbone structure and with the diagonal lines. Pile jersey knits are produced with an extra set of yarns. Uh, so these are like pile woven fabrics. So you create extra loops with uh, or extra piles on the surface of the fabric by using extra yarns. And um, this would be a good example of this. So this is the face of the fabric, this is the back. So this is actually the technical face of a jersey and this is the back, but 
because you're using extra set of weft yarns to form these piles, you have this fuzzy surface on the on that side. Um, these are piles that are uncut piles. You see that those are used on hospital socks. Um, and this is a jersey design here on the back of the fabric. And then on the wrong side of the fabric, you have the piles. Again, this is a pile knit face and back. Fleece fabrics are made usually with piles. So on the face, you have that jersey pattern, but on the back, there are piles. And sometimes you can brush those piles to create a more fuzzy surface. This is a jacquard jersey. Again, you use different colored yarns to create a pattern. This is a tuck stitch, um, but also a jacquard pattern. So you're combining tuck stitches, float stitches, and creating a design. Itarsia is another um, type of fabric. It's kind of a tapestry weave. And uh, these are some examples of this. So this is the face, this is the back. Knit jersey, you can make them with cut piles or uncut piles. Uh, so, you know, these are some more examples of pile fabrics. Uh, this is a knit terry cloth fabric, and this is called a velour fabric, kind of like a velvetish look with the piles. Um, this one is created by using extra yarns that create piles that kind of give you a fake fur look um, or fall fur look with a jersey design in the back background. Double weft knits. Um, these are interlock, double knit, double knit jacquard. These are different, more eloquent patterns that you can create, but to make these patterns, you need special machines. So double knits require um, extra set of needles, actually. So you don't use just one set of needles for these, you usually use two sets of needles. So um, this fabric here is an example of an interlock pattern. And you can see in an interlock fabric, both the face of the fabric and the back of the fabric is going to look exactly like Jersey, okay? But this is created by using two sets of needles. So double jersey, double knit, jacquard, those type of fabrics usually use extra set of needles, okay? Um, this is a double knit. This is a double knit jacquard. And you can see the face of the fabric and the back of the fabric look pretty different. Um, so normally, if it was just a jersey design, you would just see that wherever it's red here, the black yarns would be floating in the back, but you don't see that because it's a double knit. So the black yarns that are supposed to be floating are actually making stitches with a separate set of needles on the back of the fabric. This is a raised double knit fabric. So you can create these kind of look with the double knits. Okay, um, let's go to your eye textiles now. I'm gonna see if there's anything that we didn't cover in our slides through eye textiles. We talked about gauge, which is the number of needles, which would actually be the number of loops that you have in one inch. Uh, we said weft knits, you can make them by hand, but warp knits require specialty machines. We talked about the types of stitches, knit stitch, purl stitch, float, miss stitch, or tuck stitch. We said this is a knit, this is a purl where you can see, um, you can see your jersey where the crown is in the back, but then the crown is on the front and in the back on the front. So that pearl design creates those half circles. This is a tuck stitch. This is a miss stitch. 
jersey in it, face and back. We talked about ribs, two by two rib. This is a rib scarf, one by one rib. And again, those are reversible. We talked about pearl, this is face and this is back. Looks like the back of a jersey. This is a sweater made completely with a pearl knit. And then we talked about jacquard intarsia cable knits. And I didn't talk about pointel. This is produced by increasing and decreasing stitches and loop transfer to create a pattern with holes. Um, and I did mention intarsia. Um, this includes like argyle patterns. Uh, in sweaters and cardigans. So I'll show you some examples of these here. This is a jacquard jersey. I just showed you that. Uh, this is an intarsia with the argyle pattern. So it's a wool sweater. And this kind of pattern is created by the, in, I mean, this is called the intarsia. This is a mock intarsia. intarsia. So it's a jacquard jersey with the argyle pattern. It's a cable knit with a jersey base. So the base is jersey. You can see the back of it is half circle. So it's a true jersey, but you create the cable design. Point towel looks more like this. So you have a lot of tuck stitches creating this pattern. And we talked about pile jersey. So I'll just show you a couple of these pictures. Again, you can see the back, the face. Um, interlock, we said it looks like a jersey on both sides of the fabric. This is a double knit. Um, this is a polo shirt with face and back. Jacquard, double knit, sculptured knit. And this is a jacquard knit. Okay, so we're gonna stop here.